Don and I have known each other for, for many years now and just have so much love and respect for you and, and the, the way you, you walk in this world and all that you bring uh, to this work. And also to be here with, with you, Astrid, and, and the East Point community. Um, yeah, so some of the things that we're not going to focus on are more of the specific tactics for organizing direct action, for, for staying physically safe during a direct action. I know that Zan led a really rich workshop last Friday through East Point, and that video is up on YouTube for those who want to go more in-depth into those, um, those areas. And as Donna said, our, our aim here is really to um, have a conversation together, share some of the ideas and practices we're familiar with, and also elicit some of the wisdom that's, that's here in the group, in the room this evening. So um, maybe to that end, we wanted to start off with um, a question and to just invite everyone to reflect on what's bringing you here. What are you really hoping to get from the workshop today? And to do this, we'd like to split into some small groups um, and just take five minutes to reflect on these two questions. What's bringing you here? And what are you hoping to get from today's workshops? Today's workshops. So I'm going to turn it over to Astrid, who's going to open uh, some small groups and invite us to just have a short conversation about these two questions. Then when we come back, we'll talk about it some more and go from there. So welcome back, everybody. I want to check in. And just if you're willing, put your voice out in our Zoom room. Um, what do you notice that's different before you went into a breakout room versus after you went into a breakout room? And just feel free to unmute and share whatever comes to mind. I already felt like there was a little sense of connection that was built even in just that, that few minutes connecting with a couple of other people. So it was, it was really a very nice feeling. Thank mm -hmm. you. Just, there's a sense of, uh, a little sense of intimacy or being in the same room now. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and so I wanted to highlight that. Thank you all for your participation. I wanted to highlight that. We're going to talk a little bit more about it later, but even it might even be more pronounced if we were in a room sharing space together, but it still works in this virtual reality, this um, human process of social engagement. And so when we talk about the nervous system and direct action, we'll go into a little bit more detail later. And so just building on this, would also love to hear a few snippets, like a, a Polaroid snapshot in words of what's bringing you here? What, what are you hoping for from tonight? Anyone want to share that either verbally or in the chat? Well, I said in our breakout room that I'm looking forward to this time here with you people and for everything else going on up to the third of next month and perhaps beyond mm. in my good moments as an experiment in which i can achieve what or work towards what i'm working towards in my life which is to work towards a state that rumi talks about where love is our nature our deepest nature Beautiful. and it's not simply that we go to love one person or another which means for me, the hard case is from in my model, like how do I love, how do I experience love with Dick Cheney? Thank you, Bert. So yeah. beautiful image there of, of the joining the community and experiencing love. And uh, I'm just gonna read a few of the things that folks are putting in the chat here. Um, more tips and tools to be resilient, time with community. Um, Grounding practices in tense situations, um, centering with other caring people, finding a constructive way to listen to one's heart and brings one's voice into challenging situations, calm building connections. Yeah. And anyone else want to add their voice and, and just uh, the invitation to 
Sure, I'll add my voice. Uh, Please. Happy, happy Thursday. I'm Sunshine Michelle. I'm glad to be here um, because I couldn't be out on the streets of Oakland today with the big direct action. I'm a part of the Thrive community, so this was a way that I could participate in direct action in a positive, productive way and while not being out there. Great. Thanks, Sunshine. Happy that you're here. So to taking in this range of um, hopes and intentions and uh, interests from our evening, want to add some of what we're also hoping to share. And we could maybe summarize it in like four headings. Um, one, how to stay, how to connect with and stay connected to one's guiding vision, particularly in a direct action. A little bit of some background of nervous system functioning, like what's going on under the hood when we are in an intense situation. And along those lines, um, how can we prepare ourselves for those situations in the long range? And then in the moment, how can we access resilience in the moment when we need to, a kind of resilience first aid? So again, keeping with this theme of really leveraging the wisdom of all of us coming together tonight, what helps you to stay grounded and balanced? What are some of the things that we already know about how to do that, that can also help us be non-reactive in a moment of intensity or provocation, particularly in the context of civil disobedience or direct action. So what helps you stay grounded and balanced? What helps you to be non-reactive in the moment? And I'll put this question in the chat as well. And so as we've been doing, you can add this in the chat or feel free to, um, to unmute yourself and make sure everyone can do that. So I see focusing on the breath and calm, soothing, healing waters. In the For chat. me, it's focusing. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm, I'm focusing on um, also our similarities in the midst of our differences. Nice, great. I'm seeing also Telly is adding, um, sensing the body. What can we feel in the body and, and for you tingling hands. And Simona's echoing that breathing, body scans, touching the earth, pausing. Sometimes when I get, when I start to get in a conversation that might be a little tense, I can feel myself being a little shaky. So yeah, I do these things, try and feel myself grounded my body, where are my feet, where are my hands, what's mm -hmm. my breathing, and that can sometimes bring me back from that, you know, going over, so then I sound like a, you know, I, I don't make a lot of sense if I get too excited or whatever, so I try to remember that to, to help me a little bit. Great, and other things in the, in the chat here, um, expanding awareness to include the space, belly breathing, holding my own hands. So some of the themes I'm hearing here are a sense of connection, connection with oneself, connection with what's around us, right? And, and both of those helping to serve a function in a way of orienting, right? Bringing us back into the present moment in a way that is, um, that's grounded, that's connected, um, and that's clear. So we're not spinning off into thoughts, into reactions, into what ifs. So just to summarize, maybe again, some like a broader range of the ways that we can develop these kinds of grounding, resilient practices and access to those states. Um, we can think about these in a few different categories. So community and social engagement is a really broad one. Physical well-being and self-care. Right? And, and wanting to point out here again that we're talking about not just in the moment, but also the sense of what leads up to it in terms of how we're living. Emotional well-being. So gratitude, pro-social emotions. This is uh, the person who said looking for the similarities kind of touches on that. Cognitive reframing is another one, how we're thinking about things. Spirituality, faith-based practices, 
which for some of us could be connected to beauty, nature, the arts. So just a kind of large view here of, uh, of some of the things that we can draw on. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, and what I want to impress upon you right now is um, these are challenging times, right? We, we all, I'm assuming that a lot of us showing up for this particular offering are aware of the social unrest, the, murder, the murders of black and brown people that, that has been going on, but, but only now is coming to uh, the awareness of some parts of the, the culture and the society. And we have the shelter in place, we have COVID-19. So some of these some of these practices that we're gonna share with you, um, I'm seeing from the chat, folks know. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail around what's going on under the hood with your nervous system in all of these situations. Um, we can, we can offer you some somatic practices. We can offer you some meditative practices, some grounding practices. I'm I'm not really sure yet if we can um, help you love Dick Cheney, but you can take some of these practices and and try them out, and maybe you'll get closer, which would be better. And Donna, I want to I want to add one thing before we look under the hood. Sure. Cool. So just this other, just because we we had fun, I had fun making these slides. So I'll just add this one other visual. Oops. Let's try that again. So just a visual on this sense of the, the two directions that we're playing with tonight, right? One being in the moment, what can we do to access ground, non-reactivity, balance, and the sense that those moments were also drawing on a much longer term cultivation in terms of how we're living and the capacity to use some of the practices we'll share tonight and develop a relationship with them over time. I'll turn it back over to you, Donna. Sure thing. Oh, I'd like to see um, the slide on the, the orientation to threat. I think it's probably the first one, the threat response cycle. Yeah. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the nervous system. I invite questions. Um, oh, if you if you if you have a question, unmute and just ask me. It's fine. Um, if you put something in the chat, oh, let me know. I'm not going to be looking at it. I want to talk about this threat response cycle briefly. Um, if we were all sitting in a room together, we would all probably put on our social decorum hats and sit next to one another in whatever seats were available and say hello and smile. And it's that social engagement piece, often that smile, that basically says, hey, I'm okay. Um, because what our nervous system is designed to do over years of evolution is to really kind of survive to the next day. And it doesn't really know who's okay and who's not okay. So in any given encounter, way underneath in the unconscious or the less available is this idea, is this question, do I eat you or do you eat me? And we all pretend like it's not going on, but even in the best of times, that can be happening. So this threat response cycle is something novel happens in the environment. And we turn to it to assess, is it safe or is it not safe? And so that's this uh, orange thing, this preparatory orienting, if we kind of um, still think that it could be unsafe, we hone in on it more, it's called this defensive orienting, because we, we want to really figure out, well, where is the threat? And so we'll hone in on it, and all kinds of things are happening in your physiology at that point. Because if you decide it's not safe, then you'll see this defensive and protective responses at the bottom of this cycle. And you'll notice social engagement is first. People think, and it's been, we hear a lot about the fight, flight, freeze response in preparation to respond to a threat. But the first thing that happens is social engagement. You look to an attuned or powerful other that you 
have uh, a relationship with for support. And I think that is particularly important to this direct action process that you keep social engagement in your toolbox. Um, at this point, all kinds of hormones are being released in the body. The body is automatically creating a response um, called a self-protective motor pattern to help you escape, to help you survive. And that could be running, that could be freezing, holding really still, trying to disappear, could be fighting, it could be social engagement. Once the body is able to complete that response, if it's running, you escape, it's if, if it's fighting, you win, if it's you've got a social engagement with a protective other, then all of the, the motor patterns and the, uh, the adrenaline and the cortisol released in the body can, can settle and integrate and you'll come back into what we call homeostasis. So this cycle is going on all the time. Can you show, show the next slide, please, Lauren? Does anybody have any questions about that particular slide or just even any comments you'd like to share? Is this... Um, I'm sorry, I was just gonna ask quickly, can we get the slides at the end of the workshop? I love this slide particularly. It's really helpful for me to keep track of things. Yeah, I think we can, at the very least, we can just uh, print, this, uh, print this as a PDF and send it to you. We can definitely make that happen. I'll send them to Astrid afterwards. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Comment. Let's, um, yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Um, I think I've heard about social engagement and, and to make all these words a little easier to remember. I think it was referred to as friend. So you have friend, flight, fight, and freeze. You get that alliteration. I love that. All the Fs. Yeah, yeah. it's the tend and befriend, tend and befriend response. You're oh, absolutely okay. right. Yeah. That's her way. Yeah, let's go ahead to the next slide. And so again, this this friend, this tend and befriend response, people don't actually often know that that is the first thing that your system will try to do. And where you see that most is with little babies and their caregiver. And they're out on the playground and the baby's old enough to walk. And it kind of goes a few feet away. And then something novel happens in the environment. And that's a startle for that child. And then that child looks back towards the mother or the caregiver, right? And when the child gets that reassurance that eye contact that everything's okay it may go the child may go back to exploratory play so just so you know that that is actually actually the order social engagement it's using a part of the nervous system called the ventral vagal which is way more than you probably want to know and then you have the fight flight which is part of your sympathetic arousal nervous system arousal which we'll talk about later so could you go on to the next slide, Lauren? So this is a very busy slide. So just relax, let your eyes kind of take it in. They're just gonna jump around. So what I'd like to invite you to do is go to the left section and look at the middle yellow band. And you'll see that it says fight and flight in that middle yellow band. And below that in the green band, you'll see social engagement. And this is what you're really hoping for. This is the calm, settled, rounded, and more important, curiosity and openness. That is a direct message to yourself that if you're curious or someone else is curious, they're in this grounded space. Um, helping people to be in that space doesn't come from confronting them and it doesn't come from um, threat. It comes from what someone else put in the chat, like wanting to understand someone. It's hard to do that if you're not feeling safe. So what you'll see if you're looking at this green and then the yellow, you'll see this curve that's going up into freeze and then back down into deactivation. So this is what we're, this is what our depiction of your nervous system processing. And over on the left, 
you'll see at very low levels of activation are the words frustration, worry, or concern. And as that activation ramps up, it goes from frustration, irritation, anger, to rage. And it goes all the way up into the red where there's an extreme sense of life threat. In modern life, an extreme sense of life threat is very different than what we evolved for. We evolved literally out on the plains, out on the savanna, worried about being eaten by other animals. But now your boss can say something that undermines your work performance, or someone can give you a look that you don't understand. And it might start to activate this frustration, worry, concern, anxiety, and on and on. Think of this yellow band of your, as your window of tolerance, right? And when you go up into the red, you are way out of your window of tolerance. Through some of these practices where you're able to go through the complete cycle of orienting to threat, mobilizing a self-protective motor response, completing that response successfully, then you will go back up down this curve to deactivation and back down into this social engagement um, kind of grounded baseline. So what we're working on is giving you practices to help your nervous system activate and deactivate so that it can go back down to its grounded homeostasis level. You need both sides of this parabola. You need the activation so that you can prepare yourself for anything you want to do. Picking up a glass requires activation. But in this sense, you know, activating to have an appropriate response to whatever the stimulus is in the environment. There are times when you will need rage. Right? And if it's within your window of tolerance, you'll be able to express that rage. Once it hits its threshold, it will deactivate and integrate. If it's out of your window of tolerance, if your system is not practiced in handling that level of activation, stimulus, threat, then you'll something different will happen. You'll either go up into this freeze state, most likely, or you'll be stuck in on, which you'll, you'll be stuck in that fight place, or you'll be stuck in off, which is this more parasympathetic, freezy, immobility state within your system. So the practices that we're giving you today are things that you can do to kind of bump up your nervous system to be able to complete an activation deactivation cycle with an appropriate response. So to meet the stimulus that's there. And when you're talking about direct action, where you can be talking about some pretty intense stimuli. So I've said a lot. Um, this slide is something that you can look at later and kind of digest. You can see on the left-hand side, what's actually happening in your body in each of these states. So, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. Donna, I have a simple one. What was VB? What did VBC stand for? Ventral vagal. Let me see. Uh, just I saw the ventral vagal, but I didn't see a C, so I didn't think that was it. Oh, the ventral vagal complex. I see. Because, and that's getting deep into it because the. There's a ventral vagal and a dorsal vagal complex, and they're kind of they're kind of um, connected. And the ventral vagal is is the ventral. When you think of ventral, think of the face and think the the nerves and innervation of the facial muscles that we use for social engagement. Ventral is really about central social engagement. That look between often a breastfeeding mom and a baby right, and that oxytocin releasing, that involves the ventral vagal system and the ventral vagal system. Sorry. Other <clears throat> are we saying that we're, are you saying that we're still, we start with, with calmness or what if we start with 
something that's not calm <laughs> to begin with? Where does that fit? Well, one of the challenges that means you're, um, for example, that can be, uh, it's usually a conditioned response over time. And so one can have a nervous system that revs kind of high. It's in sympathetic arousal most of the time. And what that means if, is, is if that is your starting point, when there's a stimulus that requires a response, you're going to jack up even higher. Okay. And you're not going to come fully down. So you're so saying you if we if we start if somebody else is is angry, but we start from a position where we're not right there with them, that we can then perhaps keep ourselves from ramping up and and deactivate in the face of that kind of stressful situation. In essence, yes. Okay. That's that, I mean that's the old adage: take count to ten is to right. allow right. you oh, okay. to actually actually deactivate and come down. If it doesn't, you're just going to keep bumping up and you're going to bump up into those higher ranges of activation where range resides, where rage resides. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Orin, are you tracking time for me on this point? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we can take another minute if there are any other questions and then we can, and then we can bring this forward into some of the practices. Yeah, and if you've got comments or experiences of this, um, illustrations of this in your own life, I'd love to hear them. Um, I, I work on the hotline <clears throat> and sometimes people start off just very angry right away, just and so my thing that I try and do is just react to that more with, a, I try with a sense of calmness and, and so I can try and help them bring things down to a level where we might be able to have some conversation, but sometimes people start right out there, so I try and, and keep that as much as possible yeah so i absolutely can, Joyce. Yeah. And, that's a, and that's a tricky balance that you're describing <laughs> too right you want to be attuned with them and they're at this activated state and then you want to also you're bringing this this right. calmer right. demeanor that something called their mirror neurons kind of will notice below the level of consciousness they will be attuning and resonating with your nervous system so you're using your nervous system to try to help regulate their system. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Really, I, I'm actually kind of wanting to take the temperature to see if that, that was like too much um, under the hood or what are folks getting that, that might be useful to you? I'm seeing a couple Is thumbs up, Jessica. Yeah. Hi. So um, I was curious about, because in the beginning, I was kind of understanding that the social engagement was, so when we, if we were all in a room together and I look to my right and I see Mary and I, you know, my brain is kind of like, I'm always anxious anyway, <laughs> you know, am I looking to her to make sure that she is safe? And if we have a connection, then I can stay in or come back, deactivate, because maybe I'm already in it in an anxious space. So then I see that some that she is kind, like in these breakout rooms. And and then I and that deactivates that kind of more quickly. Yeah, in sense? theory, that is true. What's your experience, Jessica? Have you did you notice anything today? Oh yeah, I mean even just um I'm muting to speak. <laughs> I get a little nervous. Yeah. Um I can, I can definitely feel it in my chest, um, you know, and I've been, I've been giving a lot of presentations for work recently on Zoom for a lot of people. And, and I, can, I noticed that, especially in the beginning, I can, I'm really elevated, I think, you know, kind of in that anxious response. And as soon as I look around and, and give myself a chance to just kind of, you know, feel myself sitting and and look around at the people in the room and to see that, you know, we all have a common goal and, um, you know, to register that then talking becomes a lot easier and, uh, you know, explaining something I'm an expert on becomes easier, you yeah. know, um, it, I don't have to read my notes as much, you know, but it's definitely uh, kind of that kind of experience. Thank you. That's it exactly. And you mentioned this idea of common goal super important. I think Orin's going to speak to that a little bit later. Um, so yeah, 
I, I think uh, unless anybody else has more about. No, no, one thing. Uh, sure. It just strikes me that, especially during these times, and we're looking at, you know, direct action perhaps and other things, and that has not been my forte up until now. Um, well, not even up until now, but as I think about it, I, it, it makes me think, even though I'm very conscious of my, my, myself and my, my body and what's happening, I can imagine that when I'm in those situations where it's heightened in going toward the red, that it becomes more difficult to focus in on what you know and how to bring your response down and how to ground yourself. And so do you have any tips for when you kind of go out of your head for a minute <laughs> to bring yourself back? Yes, absolutely. Sunshine, you're ahead of the you're ahead of the class. We're gonna we're gonna go to some of those first aid tips, but I do want to point out something that you're saying, which is so true. Your neural context, your 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 neural cortex, your thinking brain goes offline with a certain level of activation, and you will not have access to your measured, well thought out, considered rational brain. And so we'll we will talk to that a little bit more. Um, if you're if you're willing to, thank you. So let's take some of this neuroscience that Donna has shared with us and some of this information around what's going on under the hood and, and start to apply it a little bit. Nancy, you, you, you put in the chat, I think it was, I think it was Nancy, like a case study example situation. Um, you know, you're walking down the street and you hear a loud bang, right? And you have the startle response. There's, there's something that, um, uh, gets going inside, you feel tense, and you look around. So there's that preparatory orienting. And then you, the mind puts together the information, it was a car backfiring. Let's say that's the situation. You get the information, the threat resolves, and then there's a little bit of relief. The cortisol, the adrenaline still going though, you're still a little bit on edge, right? But then as you continue walking down the street, you're looking around, your breath starts to normalize. And even though you went from zero to 60 like that, maybe within five minutes or so, 10 minutes, things start to calm again. So that right there, that's a cycle. Okay, so what we're exploring here is in the long range, how do we increase the strength and the elasticity of our nervous system? How do we widen that window of tolerance so that we can tolerate even more and more of those spikes of activation and get the skill so that we can let things settle when, when it's appropriate? How do we do that in the long range? And how do we support it in the moment, like that question that you just brought up, Sunshine, when, we, when, we're, when we're starting to lose it? So one of the things we're looking to do here, so we're talking about rhythm, right? talking about cycles. So one of the largest cycles that we can start to look at, particularly as we think about direct action, is if we're going into intense situations, challenging situations, where we're on high alert, are we balancing those with periods of relative ease, nourishment, connection, and support in our life? That's a really important rhythm for the long range cultivation to start to get a hang of so that we're not just go, 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 go all of the time, but there can be this arc of intensity, challenge, and then rest and rejuvenation. That longer rhythm is gonna to start to give us more of the strength and flexibility in our nervous system to be with the hard stuff. So, we want to shift now to, we're going to take a short screen break in maybe 15 or 20 minutes, kind of halfway through, but we're going to do three kinds of practice experiments together. One, we're going to do an experiment working with vision and purpose and how that can help us stay connected and grounded with strong activation. We'll do another social engagement reflection on the power of connection, and then we'll do some um, attention training and somatic meditation exercises. So this is a little bit on where we're headed. So I wanna guide us through uh, a reflection on using the power of meaning and purpose combined with visualization to help us stay grounded. 
So part of being human means that meaning is really important to us. In fact, we've talked a little bit already about orienting, like knowing where you are, right, in your environment. Well, meaning is one way that we as human beings orient to being alive, to being conscious, right? It's kind of one of the things that helps organize the world, our internal world, our external world, is having a sense of what am I doing? right? Why am I here? So meaning, purpose, a sense of direction is super powerful for human beings in terms of our ability to stay regulated. The other, the other, another aspect here is that a huge portion of the brain is devoted to visual processing. Because of our evolution, we're very visual creatures. And so when we combine these two, the sense of meaning and purpose with visual image, with visual imagery, the combination can be very strengthening, very grounding for us. So what I'd like to do is a guided reflection, visualization on identifying meaning and purpose, and then representing that with an image and kind of beginning to create a, a, a stronger connection internally with that, with that image and the meaning it represents so that that can be a reference point for us when we feel challenged, when that sympathetic activation is starting to go up. If we're in a situation in a direct action where there's a lot happening and we need to ground. So any questions about what I've just shared before we move into um, a little practice experiment? Okay, cool. So this will be maybe about 10 minutes. So go ahead and get comfortable. And you can start maybe by um, just taking a few deep breaths or rolling your shoulders, even looking around, whatever helps you to, to just shift gears. Move your body a little. And then in your own way, I invite you to turn your attention inwards. For some of us, that'll mean closing our eyes. For others, we might just kind of lower our gaze. Whatever helps you to bring your attention into your body, to center yourself, I often find it helpful to take a deep breath and lengthen the exhalation just a little bit. You might even notice the weight of your body and the places where your body touches the ground, the chair beneath you or your feet on the floor. And as you begin to settle in, I invite you to consider what's your vision of nonviolent, of the purpose of nonviolence and direct action? What's your highest dream or hope? for human beings working and living together. So just asking that question to the deepest part of yourself and, and just listen, whatever comes, words, images, a song, a metaphor, it could be anything. your highest vision or purpose for working together on this planet. And if your attention drifts, just bring it back to that question.
And whatever you're finding, whatever's coming to you, I invite you to see if you can come up with a representation of that meaning, that purpose, that vision, an image, even a word or a phrase. How can you encapsulate the essence of that vision, of that purpose? in a snapshot, in a phrase. So this is less something that we're analyzing and thinking about and more something that we're just listening for, opening ourselves to, to just see what the psyche presents. And so if an image comes to you, this could be anything. It could be real, imagined, a memory, a fantasy. And see if you can begin to make that image really clear in your mind's eye. Notice what time of day it is the quality of light, the different colors or shapes, what's, what's up close, what's in the distance. There might even be some aroma or smell in the air. And letting it become as real and vivid as possible in your mind's eye this image or representation of your highest vision, your deepest purpose around working together. Here on the planet. And then finally, as you see that image, just take a few moments to notice what's happening inside. How's your body feel? Is there any shift, any resonance or echo inside of what it's like to bear witness to this image? And then in your own time, I invite you to slowly allow that image to fade, just letting it dissolve and wash away. Letting it fade. Beginning to introduce a little bit of movement into your body, maybe wiggling your toes or your fingers, maybe swaying a little from side to side. And then in your own time, as it feels comfortable to you, starting to let in the sense data from the room where you are, the sounds, the light. Coming back to our virtual space together, opening the eyes. So this is like a first pass and we wanna take a little bit of time and um, hear from you what that was like for you, what came up. But first, just before we go in, I wanna, I wanna frame like the, how 
we're thinking about using this. So when I say this is a first pass, in order for this to really become an anchor, a resource, we have to spend time with it, to go back to that image, to go back to that visualization, to make it um, a place that we can return to at will and really call on the strength of it. And that takes time to, to deepen the, the connection and the neural pathways of the visualization. The idea being that in a moment of intensity, of frustration, of fear, we can call on that image to bring us back into alignment with our sense of purpose, meaning, and vision, and draw on something deeper and stronger than what's happening in the moment. So we'd love to hear from a few people, how was that for you? What questions came up? Were there challenges? Any insights or connections you made? And so again, feel free to type in the chat or to unmute yourself. Hey, Oren. Yeah. Yeah, thank you um, for that. Um, so I think what I'm understanding, you know, is, you know, when, we, when Donna was going through the, the cycle of the nervous system escalation, de-escalation response, I get that and I get that when, you know, you see a scary snowman or let's say someone coughs on you and you're these days mm -hmm. and you're like, oh my God, you have COVID. And so just that, I, I get that. And I, but what I was thinking of is, let's say I'm face to face with someone that's screaming at me, go back to the country you came from. Mm -hmm. And just all of that, like the feeling that arises, I feel like immediately you jump into the free state. Mm. And so what I'm hearing is that one of the ways to reground the resource in that moment is to, is to be able to kind of, you know, have a strong neural pathway back to this place that feels it's more of a parasympathetic state where, and, you know, it, it, right now it feels like a, a pretty big stretch, you know, to be face to face with someone right. doing that and say, oh, let me just take a moment, think about right. my happy place. Right, so I'm really like curious about um, about how do we kind of um, know that we're developing the skills to to have a confidence of mm -hmm. navigating those types of moments. Great question, thank you, Nancy. I'll, I'll share two things briefly, and then maybe Donna might want to add something. So, one, I think it's important to keep context in mind. And there are different tools that are going to be more or less useful in your toolkit in different moments. And when someone's up in your face, like you're saying, that's going to take a lot of practice and strength to use a visualization as the tool to come back to balance. So for me in that moment, I might be using something that's, that's more like feeling my hands or noticing the space around me because someone's really close to me and they're yelling. So I'm going to want to widen my awareness and recognize there's a lot more going on here than this person. Okay. Um, so that's one is the sense of um, different tools for different moments. Two, um, as I think, you know, Mary put in the chat here, this particular practice takes time to cultivate, to have that ready access in, com in coming back into a state that's more resourced and grounded. Donna, you wanna add anything? I do, thanks, Lauren. Um, I think Jessica referred to it. It's, you, this would require preparation. You know you're going into a situation that's, that has the potential to be very stimulating and to be very threatening. And so there'd be preparatory work that you do with yourself. Um, we'll talk about some of those practices, but this is one of them, but it is the context, like you would prepare for that. Um, and when, when just knowing what, and keeping in mind what your vision is and what your shared vision and purpose is, is something that you would be inviting yourself to ground in. But we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the more um, somatic practices um, that you can use in the moment. And it goes a little bit to what Joyce was saying. Like, do you, if you're aligned with your vision and your shared purpose for being there, then it is a little bit like um, meeting that 
hostility with something different. Like when Joyce meets this really highly activated person on the phone, if you looked at it only as nervous system processing and not content, here you are and you're meeting a very activated, super sympathetically aroused individual coming at you. Well, what does it take to help that nervous system deescalate? Or short of impacting that other nervous system, what does it take to maintain your own nervous system regulation in the face of this extreme threat where automatically your system is responding? So we're offering practices to deal with that automaticity of your system and interrupting that. But it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Any other comments, questions from this practice? Lauren, what I, um, I interestingly uh, came up with, I love the, the meditation, thank you so much, is the, the clouds. Mm. So, and, and I don't know my meteorology very well, but you know, there's cumulus clouds and there's the different types of clouds. And I've always been fascinated that you can have their cloud variations all at once. So you can have the real dense ones, then you can have the soft palette. And, and everything is just there together. So that felt good, like a sense of diversity. And then when you brought us back, and so it doesn't matter even if the clouds go away, like it parts, then they come back. It's just like an ebb and a flow. So mm. if I were in the, listening to Nancy's question, if I were in the midst of something that was very conflicting or uh, threatening to me, that maybe something I could work on reminding myself of is to look up, even if I'm inside to realize that the clouds are there and that this person has whatever need they have that's causing them to respond that way. And I have my own, maybe hold my hands, like somebody said, you know, but mm -hmm. that might give me a sense of grounding. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. Um, I, I, I found myself, it sounds a little hokey now when I say it out loud, but <laughs> I found myself in visualing, in, I mean, visualizing like a, a circle of people in a larger community and we were all dressed differently. We all came from different aspects, but we were all holding hands. And my, my, my vision was sort of that um, of shared purpose was relieving suffering. And to know that even though we were all holding hands in the community, we were still going to be, some of us still suffering at different times but we were still there holding hands through that. And then, then I, I looked at myself and we were talking about how does it feel? And I felt myself sort of on the receiving end of that. And it felt really warm and mm. with community to know that I might receive some of that, that spirit itself as, you know, remembering Lovely. in the midst of conflict is, yeah, cool. but practice. Great, thank you, Joyce. So um, I think we want to take a little break here and just in the service of this sense of like rhythm of intensity and downtime. Um, so let's take five, like a hard five minutes, stretch your legs, get a glass of water, rest your eyes. And it's, uh, it's 706 here in California. So we'll start just, just at uh, 11 after. All right, if folks want to make their way back, we'll continue. So I want to I want to highlight um, a few other images that folks shared in the chat that um, were really beautiful and touching. Uh, let's see. One was weaving the tapestry or basket and the sense of weaving communities together that Shauna shared. Um, another was was moonlight. And I'm looking for it now, but uh, for some reason not. There it is, moonlight landing on the faces of people all over the world and the sense of the whole globe. Um, and what I want to highlight here, and, and thank you both, Jessica and Shauna, and I think there was a third higher up that I'm missing. Oh, Mary was sharing that what came to you was a song, less than a vision. 
um, in some sense of a circle, is the power of our psyche to, um, to connect us with, with strength and resource that's transpersonal. That takes us beyond what we could come up with in, in our rational mind. And that's what this um, uh, practice is drawing on. And I, I don't remember who it was, but someone also made the comment that it's, well, Donna, you did this making it, uh, that it's similar to uh, some indigenous practices of calling on the ancestors. And that sense of visualization um, transcends uh, culture and um, east, west, north, south. So, Donna, let me pass it over to you, and we'll we'll do uh, a couple more a couple more practices. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. And uh, one of the things that you've been eager for, we're going to do a practice here. And so, I neglected to say this early on, um, but Jessica actually reminded me of this, uh, which is, please be here in any way that helps your nervous system feel more subtle or more subtle. And that is around whether you want to have your camera on or off, for example. You're welcome to choose whatever modality makes you most comfortable. You want to really use the chat versus your voice, or if you really like using your voice and that helps you be comfortable, please do that. So for this practice, you can be sitting, standing, whatever makes you comfortable. And what I want you to do is going to maybe sound a little odd at first, but we're using our brains, we're using our neocortex to tell us what to do, to direct our action. And I want you to take that same idea and imagine that your eyes have a mind of their own. And you're going to take your neocortex, which is usually calling the shots, and just sit it down beside you, give it a little time out, a little rest, and just imagine that your eyes are calling and directing you. And see if you can allow that to happen. See if you can allow your eyes to decide what wants to happen next. That's it. Just kind of tune into them and notice what wants to happen next. And whatever is happening, just notice whenever there's a point that's most comfortable or appealing to you for whatever reason. Like I like it a little more than, than what has been happening. And if you notice that, just check inside and see what that experience is like. And in your own time, when you're ready, invite yourself back to this more foregrounded experience of interacting, in this case, with me as the speaker. And so what I'd like to, to hear from anybody is what you noticed happening when you let your eyes be in charge. What's the first thing that happened for anyone? They went toward oh. illuminated objects. <laughs> so things that are lit up or um, anything that is moving, like the candle. Your eyes went to anything that was moving. Yes. And how was that? Um, so the candle was lit before the, the invitation, correct? Yes. But the eyes didn't go until you gave them that invitation. Right. And she knows how it was to let them go over there. Relaxing. It was relaxing. Thank you, Jessica. I'd love to hear from a couple more people. I see closed them, turned away, covered them in the chat. They wanted to move to stretch to the sides of the room. Wanted to be free. 
Why don't I scan the room? From Kawa. Anybody else want to say what their experience was like? I'd love to hear your voice. Um, it makes me feel like it's easy to participate. I noticed patterns. I found myself sort of taking in the, the broader view and sort of looking around and, and seeing what all my vision was <laughs> just landing on a little bit. Mm, thank you. And so when you did this and you allowed yourself to follow where your eyes wanted to go, what was the felt sense overall? Jessica's a little more relaxed. Thank you. Spaciousness. So this, this is actually a practice used in somatic experiencing, which is um, a theory around how your nervous system works under when exposed to trauma, like threat. And orientation is, um, Lauren's pointing out, is the work of Peter Levine, uh, a PhD out of UC Berkeley. It's 40 plus years old. You may have heard of something called Waking the Tiger. That's Peter's book. Um, orientation is something that we do naturally. It's like that orienting to threat. But again, in these conditions, we kind of invite ourselves or we use this social decorum overlay that we were supposed to behave in a certain way. But if you watch a cat walk into a room, that yes, cat do. is going to go to every corner of that room and check it out to ensure that it knows it's surrounding and that it's safe. And then you'll see it relax. Often they just roll over and start licking themselves. Um, and so that's what happens with this practice of orientation. You can pick out something in your environment. Um, Joyce, when you're on a crisis line and you're talking with someone who's really activated, you can invite them to find something in the room that catches their attention and focus on it. And what's happening is the brain can't be in two places at once. That's one thing that's happening. So it's focusing on something right in the present, right there. And so it can't go to these other activating things. In this case, where you're orienting to something in the room, it's the same principle, but it's also helping your nervous system rule out novelty or threat in the environment or tune into it. And for those of you, no one said it, felt, no one said it in the chat, but for those of you who, whose eyes didn't want to go anywhere and they kind of sort of went inward, that's also a, a way of going into the parasympathetic and to feel like still and safe. And so, so in terms of um, Orange letting me know, we're, we're a little bit behind, so I'm going to be shorter on this orientation, which is um, if you're in a direct action situation and things are really heating up, one of the practices is to really pick out something in your visual field and allow yourself to really see it and focus on that one thing. Um, so we probably, we probably don't have time for questions. Uh, yeah, there's so much other good stuff we'd like to get to. So. I'm going to leave it at that, Oren. So sure, I'll I'll just start on this this next one, and then you can you can add in Donna. Um, so we want to also highlight another modality for grounding and deactivation and staying oriented, and that is the social engagement and this tend and befriend impulse that Donna mentioned. And I'm guessing that many of you are familiar um, with a lot of the, the work that was done during the civil rights movement to prepare for nonviolent direct action, a lot of the training that was done. And one of the things that we'd like to do is to show a short video um, highlighting specifically some of the interconnectedness and the sense of social connection and engagement that was present as a, as a resource and as a source of strength and grounding and resilience during direct action. So we're gonna share the video through the chat and Donna has also put the link in the chat. Um, so if for some reason the technology is not working properly on your end and the video isn't streaming, you can just 
stop it and go to the link directly. We're going to watch the first um, minute and a half or so, and then the last 30 seconds. And then Donna, maybe you can extrapolate more after we watch the video. Sure. Okay. Hey, Oren, Donna, I think the sound is very faint. Can you share computer sound while you share screen? Yes. So let's um, you know, share. You know, Oren, the, the sound is not actually the most important thing. But yes, you can, if you're able to do it. Yeah, ahead. I am. I got it. So watch the images, too, as Donna's well, pointing out. 1960, to serve as an effort to bring together all the young people who had been participating in sit-ins across the South. These students were Southern students. They were not going to live like their parents and their grandparents lived. We accepted nonviolence, not simply as a technique, as a tactic, but as a way of life, as a way of living. If I'm in a picket line and someone comes up and strikes me, I'm not going to strike him back. If I'm uh, marching down the street in a protest march and someone spits at me, I'm not, I'm not going to spit back at him. People that were prepared and willing to go into hell's fire. Well, my trouble is hard, so hard. Well, my trouble is hard, so hard. So Nick's well, job was to facilitate whatever these students needed. If they went to jail, it was to find a way to get them out of jail. Well, so Nick's job was not to dictate to these communities what their movement was about. The organization really just did the coordination to support all of these student activities that happened from Nashville all through the Carolinas um, into Georgia. I didn't. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee got people to get together, to march, to protest, to do all of the things that human beings need to do. If they want to improve their condition. This group was determined brave and courageous young people gave everything that we had to make America better. The SNCC and its philosophy of not trying to build one charismatic leader to lead some movement, but actually to build leadership across the board in young women, young men of all different colors, classes, and educational backgrounds. I think that's SNCC's legacy. <laughs> Okay, so what I really wanted to highlight in that video, um, if you notice, there were these images of people with their arms linked together. There was another montage, in the montage, there was another point where there were people holding hands and they were singing. And this takes us back to the whole social engagement piece and how important it is to have this eye contact. Um, some people use prayer together, holding hands, linking arms, singing. I'm wondering uh, what people's thoughts are about that and what you've done in the past that helps you stay connected what alliances or agreements you could see creating now if you're going to be involved in direct action that would help you feel connected. And please feel free to unmute and, and share with us. Even your impressions of, of watching that footage is welcome. It just strikes me how important and supportive it can be to be in community with people around on an ongoing basis around 
direct action. So to be training together, to be in direct action together, to be recovering from direct action together, but, but to have those solid relationships and, and to be able to process and hold each other in that. Absolutely, May. And I think it speaks to a little bit of actually to Nancy's point um, about like, well, what am I going to do when someone's like screaming in my face? And Mary, you're hitting on it. Like there is this communal response and this knowing that you've prepared together. Anybody else? What I noticed in, in the video was regardless of what was going on, yeah, there was that sense of, of community, not necessarily holding hands, but sometimes holding hands. But even if not, there is still that sense of moving together, acting together. And yeah, that that's 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 what I felt. And I think that eye contact, yeah, is important too. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who, who maybe hasn't put your voice out yet, but kind of would like to? Could you see designing something? Uh, that would you would find supportive. One of the most supportive things were people that are not on the screen. Uh, there's lawyers and other folks prepared to go put up bail for these folks that get sent to jail and not necessarily that, but that's just one example of all kinds of supportive people that were not on the street there or out in the street or whatever, but just as important. And for me, at least create a great deal of safety and assurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Edwin. And Intiba, you're, you're pointing out that song was so important. And again, the sense of like song is, commu is communal, right? It brings us together. We feel the sound brings us into relationship. It's that the, the, the field of sound helps us to notice the ways that we are connected. And there's one that I've seen a lot just this year uh, and it's drumming. You know, when people have been mar marching and just gathering, this drumming has been super helpful. I know I've spoke already, Donna and Oren, but um, I'm really struck by, uh, this is my own process um, because I didn't really come up on the front lines in this way. And I have a fear of it, to be quite honest. And even watching films like this that I've seen before, the more I, the closer I get to direct action in the communities that I'm in, I know I have to reckon with those fears and, um, and right now in this moment, to be quite honest, I don't, it would be important for me to have my community around to be singing, to be touching or whatever it is to, that people have commented on. Um, and I don't know that that would outweigh some of the other things that I saw that cause harm or threat, you know, to be arrested, to run over. Uh, whatever it is. And, and so I don't know what to say about that. And then I think about the gentleman that just spoke about those people who are behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the place for me. I, you know, I don't know if I had some trauma that I don't know about that causes me to be so antsy about it, but I'm just naming what I'm feeling. I so appreciate you naming this sunshine and, and also kind of saying, I haven't found my place yet. But what you're naming is your nervous system is you've got you've got a standard issue human nervous system. And your nervous system is saying, this is crazy for me. This is scary. Get out of here. Because it wants to ensure your survival and your well-being. So these practices that we're talking about are really about training the nervous system. And it does take time because you're going against years of evolution that say, hey, I know a threat when I see one, get out of here. And maybe just to, to build on that, what you just said, Donna, a point that you made when you were planning this workshop that I thought was so, um, so on point that kind of like at the heart of non nonviolence is an inversion of what our nervous system wants to do in a threat, 
right? Like the whole philosophy of not returning blows, of staying non-reactive in the face of fear and danger is essentially going against millions of years of evolution. So there, it's almost like there are two challenges that we're facing in those moments. There's the immediate challenge, whatever that external stimulus is, and then there's the challenge of the restraint internally against the impulse of our nervous system to run, fight, and, and how, to, how to work with that. And so just to kind of weave in what you're, what you're bringing up, Sunshine, like the, the development of resilience happens by working within our window of tolerance and honoring where those thresholds and, and, and limits are. So let's let's go ahead and just get to a couple of practices. They're very easy to do. They're very small. What is important about them is a kind of constancy. It's like a lifting a weight and building a muscle, right? If you train this, sitting in the fire becomes much more doable. And you'll know it because you'll feel it in your nervous system. You'll feel a reduction in the level of your reactivity. You'll feel a reduction in the level of your fear response. So um, if you're willing, I'm going to do a little experiment with you. And it's it's fairly benign for most folks. So just manage your own activation. Um, and that makes it seem even more serious than it is. But if you're willing, just, play, just go ahead and go along. And you can obviously opt out of this experiment anytime you want. And guess what? You don't have to even move from your seat. So this is to give you a little bit of insight into your own nervous system. So as you're sitting there, camera on, off, whatever you're comfortable with, I'm going to ask you to take your tongue and press it upwards against the roof of your mouth, against your upper palate, with a little bit of pressure. And don't do that too long, just stop. And what do you notice, if anything? You can tap back in just by pressing up again and seeing what you become aware of. And again, wanting to make space for folks who haven't shared yet on our call this evening. Yes, any part of the upper palate, just take the tongue and see if you can kind of press up against the roof of your mouth. I noticed the tongue as a muscle. Yes, tongue is a muscle. Thank you. Less breathing. Body becomes a bit more tense. I'm seeing in the chat. Yes. Anything else? Shoulders raise. My eyes actually kind of distend a little bit. So you have just tapped into your sympathetic arousal. Because these are all the things the body does under threat as it's preparing. This is your sympathetic nervous system. And you can actually impact it. That simple exercise shows that you can have an influence over it. So thank you all for that. I want to try another experiment. And once again, you don't have to go anywhere. And you can opt in or opt out. Thank you all for playing. I want you to notice, it might help if you do this eyes closed, but it's, it's or downcast, but it's really up to you. I want you to notice what it's like right now on the inside of your mouth. And particularly, how your tongue is resting inside your mouth. Is it contacting the teeth on the sides or in the front? If you were able to relax every muscle that was holding your tongue, as if your tongue were made of honey and was almost fluid and might just spill right out of your mouth if you didn't Hold it in any way. If 
all the muscles related to your tongue relax to the vacation. And in your own time, when you're ready, bring that experiment to a close and put your tongue to use and share with us. Come off mute and let, let me know how that experience was for you. Intaba says breath lengthens. Jaw loosens from Jessica. Relaxing and grounding. Love to hear some voices. Sunshine, anyone, anyone who'd like to can never hear too much. Salivating more. Yeah. Anybody know what, what's happening here in this second experiment? Tongue floating in the mouth. Anybody willing to come off mute and take, uh, take a guess? What just happened? Nancy, yes, you are correct. It's the parasympathetic response. It's the deactivation spot response. Sometimes people call it the rest and digest. Uh, and this is also something you can do when you feel the activation happening in your body and you're out in a direct action and you want to try to calm yourself down. Yes, a sense of weightlessness. So again, you can impact your, your nervous system when it's screaming that you need to get out of there. You can start to, you know, we have that activation deactivation cycle. We wanna make sure we can come all the way down before we go up again. This is one of the ways that you can affect that in the moment. Hey, Donna, what do you think about, instead of you doing another one, I can do the one I was gonna do next just to, Change up yeah, voices and then you good. can do yours after. Good. Okay, so let's keep going with this, just exploring these experiments here. And uh, the, the kind of core concept we're playing with, or the core capacity rather we're playing with, is this capacity that we have to choose where we place our attention. Right, so the visualization exercise was based on that capacity. Right, you're, you're going into the mental realm and the visual realm. The muscular exercises Donna was just leading with, we're, we're directing attention that way. So I'm gonna do another short um, practice. It'll be more of a guided one. Just practicing putting your attention in a few different places of sensory awareness to see what the effect is. And specifically for each of, of us to see which one of these is the most accessible. So consider this like a little experiment and what you're exploring here is which of the following is the easiest for you to feel and the most grounding, supportive, or helpful, all right? So as we did before, let's start with taking a deep breath. And this time we're gonna do it together in a, in a more kind of coordinated or specific way. I want you to breathe in through your nose really deeply, fill your lungs from the bottom all the way up to the top. And then breathe out through your mouth long and slow in a thin stream of air. And notice how that feels to breathe out all the way out. And then one more time, breathing in, fill your lungs all the way. And then let the air out in a slow, thin stream of air like you're breathing out through a straw. Feel what your body feels like as you breathe out. And then letting your breath return to normal. You can either close your eyes or just lower your gaze. See if you can begin to notice the weight of your body. How, how do you know 
that your body has mass or weight right now? What are the actual sensations that you feel where your body touches the chair or the floor or the ground? It's becoming aware of the force of gravity in your own body. And just seeing if you can start to sense the downward force of gravity and also the stability or the support of the earth beneath you. So just noticing this aspect of your experience, weight in the body, the firmness, the steadiness of the ground. The next, see if you can notice your spine, literally your backbone. For me, I notice even as I say that, I kind of sit up a little bit taller involuntarily. Another way of sensing this is how do you know that you're upright? What are the actual sensations? Maybe you feel the back of your spine. You might notice the center of your spine. The vertebra, you could even gently move your, your back a little bit, kind of bending to one side or the other, or twisting slightly to engage the muscles there and start to feel that central column running through the torso. and noticing just what it's like to feel your spine, to become aware of it. And then last, from feeling the sense of core, I just invite you to become aware of the space around you. Notice how there's nothing pressing on you, in front of you. You're not crammed in a subway car, people all around, there's space around you the space of the room, using your imagination to think of the space of the outside the building where you are, the space of the sky, just getting a sense of wide open space and noticing how that is for you. And then in your own time, just bringing your attention back, back to the sound of my voice, back to our virtual gathering, letting your eyes open in your own time. Okay. So we did, we did four things there. I'll just name them. First, we did that long, slow exhalation and we touched into gravity and the support of the ground. We noticed the spine, and then we widened awareness to space. So for those who have your cameras on, maybe just a show of hands, I'll, I'll run through those. How many people noticed a palpable shift with the out breath, raise your hand. You could feel a shift in your state, uh-huh. And then for the next three, um, for how many people was feeling weight and gravity and the ground the most tangible and accessible of those three? Raise your hand if that was the one that you were like, oh yeah, I can feel that. Uh -huh. How about the spine? Was that the most clear for anyone? Mm -hmm. Mary, great. And Raya. And what about space? How many people felt a, a, a palpable connection with that or that was really tangible for you? And that one's more subtle. Mm -hmm. Nancy, cool. And Joyce, any comments, any brief comments or questions on, on, on this little series of um, somatic exercises we did? 
Yeah, Donna. Oh, sorry. The famous phrase, you're muted. I'm going to add this one because it's such a good one in an emergency situation and it's only going to take us 30 seconds. So before we talk about it, before we debrief, go for it. Before we, because we're going to debrief them all, yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. So rub the fingertips of one hand together as if you could actually feel the fingertip ridges. And if you don't think you can feel the fingertip ridges, see if you can touch them together lightly enough that it almost tickles. And as you do that, this is from um, a man named Shirzad Shamin's work is called Positive Intelligence. You can look it up and there are many other practices. This is called a positive intelligence rep, um, repetition. And it brings you into this single point of focus, this that takes your system and your nervous system down. So that's the one I wanted to offer. You can do this on your own with your hand in your pocket. You can do it in public. It's just an immediate thing that you can do. And that I would suggest practicing throughout the day to start training your attention and your nervous system and your ability to deactivate. Okay. So let's so, take yeah. a few Go minutes ahead. to hear from, from folks. How was this for you? Questions, comments, experiences? I appreciate it uh, because I'm so used to thinking of just grounding with the gravity that it really felt wonderful to me to think about these other ways to to do it too then opened up my experience a bit. So I appreciate that. Great. Um, I found in all of 2020 as 2020 progressed uh, that I need to make a conscious decision to practice nonviolence as a lifestyle, uh, personal level on up, uh, because us versus them just ain't working anymore and it's bringing us all, the whole planet down. Uh, and then uh, commit to practicing and so any type of conflict in daily life, I try to have the presence of mind to say, you know, thank you to the universe. Now I get to practice um, doing no harm and to expanding myself and to be, you know, force myself to be a little bit more evolved. Um, for instance, with um, arguments with my spouse um, rather than hurling you this and you that, uh, I try to, um, it, it's a great opportunity to practice, to become aware and to listen empathetically and um, to not talk. <laughs> um, and today at a text-a-thon, uh, as we're sending these hundreds of texts, we're going to get some replies that say, F off, you know, stop sending me these texts. I was surprised, you know, after months of having made this personal commitment to myself that, you know, it didn't bother me to get like, you know, two, three sentences of F off, you stupid, you know, don't, you know, contact me again, um, go Trump and blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of saw that and I didn't react. Um, and I was delighted at not reacting. So not that I can go out and, you know, <laughs> um, be six inches in front of a policeman, but um, I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, there's the beginnings of a foundation there and that it really is, um, a total commitment uh, yeah. you know, of my life versus, oh, I'm going to do it for this event because something might happen there. 
So that's that's what I know. Beautiful. Well said. Thank you, Rhea. I want to address a couple of things in the chat. Um, so there's one comment, essentially, we're taking our attention away from our cognitive perception of threat and to safety. And in a way, that's true. And I also want to say, you know, these situations sometimes are highly charged. And it's not about not being aware and focused on them for your own safety. We're actually trying to talk about your um, nervous system well-being and long-term well-being. We're talking about ways to help the nervous system deactivate. But you could be really focused on, like, that's why it's such a challenge. You, you will be oriented to what appears to be a threat. But how can you invite your nervous system to not keep ramping up while that's happening? How I think it's really important, something we haven't talked about because it's not the focus of this, but you know, you can be in that situation like in the front line of it, but take opportunities just to step back, to take time out and come back in. Um, but it's not about ignoring um, the actual threat that might be right in front of you. And in terms of an, uh, for folks with difficulties, um, carpal tunnel, you can do the, the fingertip Piku reps by simply running the fingertips of one hand down the back of your hand, or maybe just holding the fingertips together and feeling the two hands together. So I saw, I saw Bert, you had your hand up also. We wanna hear from you briefly. We also need to start moving towards closure. Uh, Astrid has a few things from East Point to say, and we'd love to also do a super quick poll to just hear how this has been for folks. So Bert, would you like to share briefly what, whatever was on your mind? Briefly, I get it. I wanna support Raya. And uh, if people don't know the story of David Hartso, who was a man who was one, a white man very young, in his early 20s, I think, in the lunch counter, a man comes up with a stiletto knife and says, you have 30 seconds to get out of here or I'm gonna run you through. Mm -hmm. And David Hartzell showed what's possible for us as human beings because he'd been practicing this, which was he said to the man, you have to do what you think is right and I'll have to try and love you no matter what. And the man dropped his stiletto turned around, walked out, and people, somebody saw tears coming out of his eyes. Mm. I think that shows what's possible for us. Not that I can do it all the time or any time, but it's possible. It's good to aim for, I think. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Beautiful. My, my nervous system responded just to that story and resonated with this kind of uh, vibration. Um, yeah. Thank you. Do we have time to hear from uh, Ty, whose who's hand is up? Hi, um, thank you for sharing that story. That, that really was heartful and probably a beautiful way to end all of this. But I just wanted to um, thank everyone for being here and thanks for all those techniques. And also point out that we've been talking a lot about preparation for these types of events and, and in the moment of what to do to regulate ourselves in the event. And I just wanted to bring up that we can't forget afterwards, like we are still so emotionally charged, even days, weeks, months later, that these techniques probably will come in um, even more importantly in those times because, you know, our friends, family, loved ones, our communities are going to feel the after effects of everything that probably ran through us during these um, at events and activities. And the last thing we want to do is bring all of that onto yeah. our loved ones. Um, and the woman that was speaking about, you know, being able to, um, as she was doing the uh, textathons, and I remember um, doing the callathons, and I had one woman who just at the moment of hello, I'm from the Democratic Party. She just, she was at level 20 on a scale of 10. And I was able to be compassionate and listen and accommodate her. And we had a really long, really long, like meaningful discussion together. And I came out of that really, really um, 
like just felt very thankful for that interaction. But I realized I haven't gone back to doing those calls. Mm. And there's something inside of me that even though I had a really wonderful outcome, I know that my body and my psyche is still dealing with those emotionally charged that interaction so um i think this is great to really take into our practice after, thank you after really appreciate it heartened, heartened to hear these stories and uh, in the interest of time i wish we could hear more but really loving to hearing about it and and honor and still honoring the wisdom of your system so thank you both for sharing what's possible so astrid maybe we can turn it over to you Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Oren. Thank you, all of you who have shared, all of you who have held space in this, these two hours that we have spent together. It's, uh, it's really a privilege and it's, uh, I feel a lot of gratefulness in my heart right now, knowing that you all who are here are coming to learn these practices to be safer for yourself and those that are around you and those that are on the other side because that's what really all that is, these practices are allowing us to be more present for all of us who are on the ground when we are in the streets. I am going to transition really quick to a little bit about gift economy and about the different ways that East Point is going to uh, bring opportunities for you to put into practice the different practices that we've learned from Oren and Donna. If you want to leave, feel free to do so. Feel free to leave your thank yous in the chat quietly. I will send out also an email with all that I'm going to be speaking about right now, uh, all the links and everything. So I'm going to put, first of all, some links in the chat for donations. Uh, really, please, please, wherever your heart, uh, whatever your heart is able to offer financially, prayers, love, uh, please direct all abundance towards our speakers and towards East Point. Half of the donations tonight will be going to our speakers and half to East Point. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, you can see my screen, everyone. Yes. I'm there. Okay. At East Point, we operate on a gift economy basis, which means that the reason why this workshop is here is because people before you paid give some financial resources to East Point for us to continue uh, working out. Um, as you can see, most of our revenues come from our community as per the numbers from last year. So we're intensely, immensely grateful for um, everything that our community is doing for us to be there. Not, none of that would happen without everyone's generosity. So whatever your heart feels called to, please just direct all donations to um, this link that you can see up there, eastpointpeace.org slash donate, which is also in the chat. The link is also on the webpage um, of the event. So feel free to go on the website and get that. Um, in terms of uh, what East Point is offering right now, this is the very last workshop of our preparing together offerings. Um, so many workshops uh, have been offered in the past month. It's been incredible. Almost a thousand people have signed up. And now is the time of deepening together. We're having events every single day in person and also on Zoom on some days for people to come together um, and uh, share space as we're preparing for the election day on Tuesday, but also the time that's coming after, uh, which is probably going to be intense, um, even if we're in the Bay Area, which is uh, fairly, um, fairly homogeneous in terms of uh, political orientation, there might be violences. So please take care, make a plan. Um, remember all the practices that you've learned tonight, teach them to your beloved friends, family, it's really important. Onwards after the fourth, we'll have uh, actions. You will be, um, you will receive emails from us. So stay in touch. And um, there are a couple of things that are important for you to remember. In order to stop a coup, research shows that the most important thing to do is vote. The second one is to refuse election results until every vote is counted. 
The third, please non-violently take to the streets if a coup is attempted. If you don't feel comfortable going onto the streets, feel free to support those who are willing to go with any skill that you have. And um, if needed, shut down the country to protect democracy, which includes boycotts and more information will be shared uh, through our outlet, but also through Choose Democracy, if really uh, a coup is attempted. And if you can make teams, that would be wonderful, which is coming together with three to eight people that you know, three to seven, making a team of maximum eight people. Uh, for example, today we had a mural action going on and we will have a similar one um, in the week, probably after the election, if anything is attempted. So please stay tuned on our social media. Uh, there are practices that are available. I will send you the link. The link is in the chat that you can practice with your team to continue getting yourself ready. This is scary. It's not easy. And so it requires a lot of practice and uh, inner work. And again, last, last thing, when your team is ready, please tell us uh, the chat again, the chat has the link. I will send it in the email that I will send as a follow up. And uh, really thank you for anything that you're doing, even being here in spirit, whether, whether you can go into the streets or not is really meaningful and you can use your skills beyond the election too. So that's, uh, that's that from me. Thank you for you who are still here. It's, uh, it's really beautiful to be sharing space with I mean, uh, wonderful community members, as you were mentioning in the session, uh, connection is very important. So with these words, um, I'll close the session and I will give you back the hand, Oren, Donna, for our closing. Well, thanks so much for having us, Astrid. And folks, uh, Donna's put her email address in the chat there. We would love your feedback. You can send it to Donna. Um, love to hear what worked for you, what could have been better, and what, what you're taking away from, uh, from the program. It's been wonderful to, to hear your commitment and your desire to learn about these and to give myself and Oren an opportunity to share some of these practices that we hold dear. And um, thank you, East Point Peace Academy. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again. Thanks so much. It was Thanks great. Thanks so much, everyone. Giving you blessings, everybody. Bye, mm, thank everyone. you. To thank you. Peace. Peace. Bye, Good everybody. Night. Good night, Bye. everyone. Thank you. Be safe. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.